it's always the kiss of death. Okay. Always the kiss of death when you say, oh, yeah, we'll definitely be home by seven, way before. Right? <laughs> no worries. Um, folks, so no, I just hit, in- it's Sharon speaking. I just hit a record button, but I didn't check first, so I, I can stop and restart. Is it okay if we record Marcus's conversation with us? Uh, is there anyone who has a concern with that? No, it's good by me. No. All right. Thank you. Then we'll leave it recording then. Welcome, everyone. I'll turn it over to Heather in just a minute, but let's just take a moment to center ourselves in prayer wherever we find ourselves. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather this night. We thank you for this digital space that brings us all together. We thank you for the wisdom that Marcus has already shared with us and will explain further tonight as we continue to discern next steps around improvements in the sanctuary of grace. We thank you, O God, for all of the open minds that have come here this evening. And we pray that as we chat together, we will have the sense of your holy presence with us as we engage in our holy manners of caring and sharing. Thank you, God, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, Miss Heather. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Oh, we've had more people show up during the prayer. Okay. It's like mysterious. Now there's more people. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce Marcus to you and probably Marcus to everybody else because, Marcus, I don't think you can I don't think you can see anybody. So you don't even know who you're talking to. No, no, just uh, dialed in. I'll also give you a quick heads up because we are heading out towards Warsaw here shortly. So there's probably a point where I will totally lose contact and have to dial back in in about 12 or 14 minutes. Okay, well, I'll be very brief at the beginning then. <laughs> and I'll ask Brian cool. to come up here, please. Okay. <laughs> Multitasking, all right. Um, Well, you've already taken a look at the quote from Marcus. Um, Marcus has just finished doing some sound type things that I can't explain for the games in Tokyo. So I think he's got a clue about what he's doing. Um, And Marcus, I'd like you to just know that we have here various board members. Um, Mm -hmm. Our church organist, Paul Tessier is here as well. And uh, sound guy, Neil uh, LeBeau and President of the board, George Flavel and Sharon Ballantyne, who I believe you've spoken with, and Ross Allen, who is um, the handy guy who builds things, and oh, board wonderful. members Jane and Paul and Bruce, and I also see Marianne and Brian Bell. So you won't remember you. any of that, but yeah. I think I'll have just, you. unless Brian has anything to say, the floor is Marcus's. <laughs> Sharon, I'm just going to interject for a moment, Marcus, to say, folks, if you do have questions, it would be helpful to just say your name as you, just so Marcus has a context of names as they pop up through the time. So, Sharon, thanks, Marcus. Back to you. Yeah, thank you uh, kindly. And I mean, so, so I take it then, as we said, pretty much everybody here has had a chance to go over the basic details of the uh, outline of the proposal that uh, that Mars Music submitted. Is that correct? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So what I'll do then, I'll just kind of go through the overview uh, very quickly and uh, just kind of, you know, reinforce our priorities and why the priorities are uh, as we've suggested. So step one, you know, to, to bring, I guess you can say, to bring the, the, the sound system into the current decade, let's say, you know, that uh, the first step is that the, kind of the central hub that everything gets connected to, it's either going into or going out of, right, is the, is the mixer. And, uh, you know, I, so I see right now that you've got an, uh, a couple of analog mixers in there. And, you know, and those are, Still have some things to recommend them, but you know, going forward, something that you can program that has a good amount of processing uh, that'll allow switching between operators, yet still allow you to get it back to the way that it was last Sunday. In particular, if you're looking to up the quality of the the sound experience in there, the usability, and uh, even potentially look at having a space that can generate revenue, you know, th- this is the way. 
I shouldn't even say this is the way of the future. This is actually the way of the, the present in any, uh, you know, kind of uh, church of this kind of size with this kind of channel count. And uh, the company that the reason that we uh, like Allen and Heath in particular, even though there are many excellent products in the market, uh, is mainly also because of the reliability and stability, not only of the product, but also the distributor. Allen and Heath has been with the same distributor uh, literally for decades, and it's the biggest in Canada and North America. So the nice thing is when you're buying something like this, uh, not only is there local support and expertise, uh, but also the, uh, the, you know, the, the company that provides the servicing, should anything ever be necessary, uh, is absolutely stable. And, you know, coming not only, I mean, I, not only am I an expert in certain sound related matters, but I also happen to have a tremendous amount of experience in church sound. Uh, not only do I uh, pastor, I've also got national level experience with uh, the tech side of uh, uh, a particular church denomination as well. So, you know, so to me, I always look at it. I don't want to take chances with my church's money, and I wouldn't take chances with your church's financial uh, investment and stewardship either. So that's the reason for Allen and Heath. And it allows us then to get the, you know, the best out of any other equipment that we would attach to the system. Some people may now disagree with the, uh, the second choice, but to me, having been in the sanctuary multiple times over the last few years, uh, sound treatment, I think, is the, the next obvious task. There's no point putting fantastic speakers in a space, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, not controlled enough to really justify the sound of them. And uh, frankly, the speakers you have now, you've, which aren't amazing, but we haven't even heard the best of those speakers. So the next step would be to treat and to control the sound in that space. Not only will it be a significant improvement for people in the sanctuary, but as capturing the service, as streaming the service becomes more and more important, uh, you know, that's very helpful. It's difficult to assess what the maximum amount of sound treatment uh, in that space is going to end up being, you know, without conducting some pretty, uh, you know, intensive and, and costly kind of measurements, but between, you know, experience and a little bit of, of testing that we did, I can safely say the budget to over treat the room is not happening anyway. So you can safely put a good, you know, you can put a good dent in it and then kind of uh, evaluate how much more you, uh, how much more you want to uh, spend beyond that. And you'll see the priority is for relatively large, uh, relatively thick certified treatment that looks, you know, kind of attractive. And if you have somebody who is very handy at building, let's say, wood frames or other methods of, of uh, integrating it into the uh, sanctuary, you know, it, it can look like it was always meant to be there in the first place while still providing functionality. So that would be the next stage. And to me, only once we've got the mixer and the sound treatment, is it really worth getting serious about then upgrading the actual speakers as well? You know, because then we can properly tune the room and do those types of treatments. Then we can properly cover the room, getting speakers that have the right high frequency driver. You could call it a tweeter or horn that will then uh, allow for the most intelligibility of sound in the room, in particular spoken word, but of course for the worship as well. And you'll notice for the speakers, we have two types of technology as options. And some people really prefer to use passive speakers like you have in there now. Passive speaker means that a power amp that's separately located is supplying the power for the speakers. So why would we do that? Well, mainly because we could reuse the existing cable run and we don't have to have an electrician put in a remotely switchable um, outlet because when you have speakers that are active with the power built in, you need to be able to power them on and off separately from the sound system. 
any power amp should always be last on and first off, whether it's built into the speakers or not. So active speakers, which then would require both signal from the mixer going to them and an AC connection. Why do people like active speakers? Typically because if you're buying a great set of speakers and Martin Audio, it doesn't really get much better. The theory would be that the company that built the speaker and designed it also then would have picked the ideal power amplifier to go into that speaker, thereby maximizing the, the tone and performance. To me, this is a matter of personal preference. What's wonderful with Martin Audio, not only do they make great sounding speakers, they often offer them as both passive and active. So based on, you know, uh, let's say the availability of an electrician, some congregations have some that are very generous with their time. So maybe then it makes sense to have the, the active speaker as opposed to passive. But again, the key is really quality, having the right kind of uh, uh, coverage and having enough headroom, which is a nice way of saying we never want to push that system so hard that it begins to distort or get unpleasant sounding. We want to have a speaker system that's slightly overpowered because then it'll always remain uh, very, very clean and pleasant to listen to. So that would be that, you know, and then after that, we have some miscellaneous little things. I noticed when I was in the, in the uh, church again, you know, down the road, you would definitely want to upgrade to matched microphones. They don't have to be extremely expensive, but it's easiest to do sound when every vocalist has the same microphone, both for uh, feedback from floor monitors and positioning, and also just being able to make all the mics and the levels sound the same. And, uh, you know, also you may get a couple more floor monitors. It's not essential for the floor monitors to all be the same, but it's very nice and pleasant and easier and predictable to do sound when the performance of, you know, the, um, uh, of all those Marcus, I think you're in Warsaw. That again, we like to do these sections. Nope, that's not like, you know what, the worst part is like, I'm on the uh, water. You're fading, right. Marcus. Sure. Oh, still there? I'm here now. Are you Are you in Warsaw? Yep, yeah. No, no, I'm, uh, we're on Water Street. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened there then. We got closer, that's what we Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, the the strangeness of that, and yeah, I mean, think including real quick, you're always uh, oh, you're gone again. Partnering. Oh, Water Street must be noisy. Yeah, we're, yeah you know, we're we're to pull over. I think it's maybe the the zoo. Uh, no, is is this better now? Yes. Yeah. Clear. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah we just uh, the other yeah, Peterborough above B Street. Where it's at. So anyway, the last thing I'll say is in terms of installations like this, we're always good at partnering uh, with people, right? So if you want everything to be totally turnkey and, you know, we'll install everything, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want some consultation on how to install it and save some money, that's great. Anything in between, that's, you know, that's great. You know, it's... Uh, so we're always very easy to get along with that way. And then finally, uh, as far as training goes, that's always a big one. And uh, part of any successful installation like this, we know where you shift into a different gear with newer technology. It's important that people feel comfortable and, and competent in, um, uh, in operating the gear. And again, that's something else where we have, um, uh, you know, multiple, uh, I would not hesitate to say like, you know, Canadian class, whatever city um, they would find themselves in. Uh, you know, we also have good expertise that way that we have people of a class to do the training uh, where you're learning from professional people. But again, not people who want to hide knowledge or make it difficult, but who want to make it easy for you to uh, run that system in the future. And yeah, that's, that is the overview. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Marcus, and especially thank you for doing this on the run or the drive. Oh, no, you know, no, <laughs> you know, well, you know, hey, I'm I'm not driving, so special. Oh, that's good. To, to Nicole for letting me focus on this while I'm 
uh, talking away, consuming all the air in the car. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> I don't know if the board has a talent switch. Um, does anyone have any any questions for Marcus while we still have him here on Water Street? Well, maybe. Do I understand that he outlined basically maybe a four step process? Um, great, missed something great like question. Hmm? Right. So no, it's I wouldn't really call it a four step process, but I would call it. I mean. Sometimes these things do have to be in stages, and we are definitely very sensitive to that. But uh, I would say, you know, there's a real degree of synergy, uh, especially with the first three. Having said that, if you said we have to do this in stages, I would be very bullish on saying uh, do the mixer and do the sound treatment as a starting point because it will already begin to sound significantly better both in the room, but then also by proxy, you'll be able to make the current equipment sound as good as it's possible for it to sound. But then at the same time, I would then say, but then upgrade the main speakers as soon as you possibly can. And then all the other stuff I consider as auxiliary that can be deprioritized if the money isn't there until it is there to do it properly. Any of the stuff we are suggesting is things where it's a long-term investment. There are no half steps or we, you're, you know, we're, we're trying to not get you to buy anything where, you know, then a year later you think, okay, well, we shouldn't have bought that. Now we're going to, here's a useless piece of equipment. What are we going to do with it? No. Stages, yes, if necessary, in the order they're numbered, but definitely no sideways steps or, you know, no one step forward, one step backward stuff. Hey, Marcus. That's Brian across the table here. Sorry, Brian across the table here. Um, question about uh, sound treatment too. Um, when we're thinking yes. about a live streaming, we also mentioned live streaming and the idea that the video and the audio, especially when you're in a digital environment, are intrinsically linked. And oh, yes. with, our, with our church, we've got those big windows down the side, right? Of, of each of the, uh, uh, down the sides of the sanctuary. If we were to yep. buy a really, you know, heavy uh, uh, curtain material that, that hangs, um, could that mm -hmm. not pull double duty and uh, absorb sound as well as, as block light to facilitate uh, filming? Like, is there ways we can multi, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Multi-purpose. Uh, Multi-purpose. Kill more birds with one stone, so to speak. Yeah, we don't absolutely and fantastic uh, point. And, it, and it's funny, I mean, as you probably know, it is, many people know, windows and studios and windows and broadcast or really any kind of hard reflective surface can be a real issue. And uh, heavy curtains, you know, if you've ever been on a stage, let's say like in a theater, you'll find that those heavy and kind of sort of limp hanging curtains, right? Uh, they definitely can pull double duty because they will absorb some sound, much like when you take carpet out of a room, all of a sudden that's gone, right? And then the room sounds different. So if you had heavy, and again, I really mean like heavy uh, hanging drapes to cover that up, yes, they will definitely take out some uh, of the high frequencies. They typically won't affect mids or bass at all because they're not sort of uh, dense enough. What we have done is uh, materials that would be called uh, mass, impe uh, mass impregnated material. So imagine now like you had a moving blanket, but then it was even heavier because it was, you know, it was kind of mass load material was even in that blanket, right? Kind of so there are, yeah, right. So, but now imagine, take that to the next step, kind of similar to something like, you know, floor underlay or something like this but it's like a, a mass loaded vinyl that we then also use to cover up the window. You know, so you, you'd kind of have it pulled up in behind the curtain or whatever else if you want, and, and even let that one pull down and go over the window. And, uh, you know, that'll even take more of the energy out of the room. So yeah, there are definitely ways of, uh, of doing that, but usually a multi-tier approach, like have, you know, have the curtain and then if necessary, you'll probably find even having some additional material, some mass loaded material that doesn't look quite as pretty behind it. 
uh, would would help beef it up even more. And of course, it depends on the window, right? I didn't look that closely at uh, what kind of windows they are, and some are uh, much more effective at the sound already than others. And I had one more question while I'm at it. Um, I, I was in the room about a week ago, and you mentioned the removal of the carpet, right, and the pews, which would have done some sound absorption. I was looking, you're talking about the, the speakers that are currently installed, and they're fairly high up on the posts, and the horns are yep. literally shooting over people's heads. And I was just yeah. noticing that, yeah. of course, they've got that back wall, which is going to be really nasty. So this is a two for question. Could we, mm -hmm. after we do sound treatment in a board for the short term, if we lowered the height of those speakers on those posts, would that also reduce some of the reflection off that top of the, the back wall? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, great question, great point. So you're exactly right. I mean, if because if, if you think of those speakers, right, they'll have that kind of the, 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 the woofer, right? There's kind of like the big part. And then there's like the little opening horn where it's coming out. And exactly wherever that horn is focused, you know, it's not quite like a laser beam. It's kind of more of a cone, right? But where it hits, but where it's aimed is where it's going to go. It'd be like a shotgun with a bit of a choke on it. And yeah, if the horn, and I think we determined this a couple of times we we're in, if that horn is aimed at that kind of wall, and so what'll happen is unless somebody's 10 feet tall, they're never going to hear the best sound out of those speakers because of how they're aimed. But then they will hit that back wall and they're hitting a hard reflective surface. That high frequency information will just bounce uh, right off that. And then you get these kind of weird swirling effects that we're kind of hearing in there anyway. So absolutely, you'll see in some churches where they have basic speakers, but they want to get the best out of them. Sometimes they'll even mount them upside down with the horn at the bottom so that it's easier to get the part that allows you to clearly understand words. You know, the horn, that it allows that to be more effectively aimed at the uh, audience at a more realistic angle. So yes, definitely positioning. What, the, the, reason, the reason that occurred to me is I was thinking about playing many, many dances over the years and where you put, you know, mm -hmm. portable PA speakers. And I realized that these are shooting over our heads. And not only that, people tend yep. to, well, they stand to sing, but uh, yes. a good lot of the time they're seated. So it's really yep. um, ineffective. The, the, the other question I had is about sound treatment for for the uh, for the ceiling potentially i noticed mm -hmm. we took the carpet out so we've created another yep. um hard reflective surface which is exacerbating uh the sound bouncing around in there you talked about sound treatment is is it should it be done in stages because i've I, in the you my, my armchair uh sound engineer skills here tells me back wall windows but potentially something on the ceiling as well. Yeah, I mean, again, absolutely. Uh, it's definitely one of those things that, again, you know, with, with a, like, uh, uh, costly process, it would be possible to investigate this in, in real detail. It would probably cost nearly as much as uh, half the sound treatment will ever cost. So to me, that's why like, doing the sound treatment in a space like this in, uh, yeah, in chunks of improvement. And I'd never want to be accused ever of trying to over-treat a room. And sometimes the shock is so great from, you know, totally live to fully treated that some people aren't even sure anymore like what happened, right? So you're exactly right. Uh, yeah. The back wall is definitely the starting point. And if you feel that the windows are problematic, yeah, absolutely. And you do those. And yeah, because then you have these opposing surfaces now, uh, bottom to top, and you'll kind of hear this weird kind of ping. We've all heard this in rooms that we're in. And um, yeah, so it might not happen during the sermon, but it might happen during the worship where all those voices are going forward and then the sound is coming down and people are like, wow weird it's like when everybody really sings we get this weird effect then yes the uh and because we've lost a little bit of dampening from the carpet yes having some floating panels on the ceiling is definitely something uh, that may have some you know the kind of absorb and scatter uh, which would be to say to diffuse our 
Marcus, you're dropping out again. We're losing you. Yeah. I get, I get the impression the answer is probably, possibly, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Still there? Uh, I think if I propose. Marcus. Well, I'm right, texting him. Oh, no, sorry. Weird. We're losing um, you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, basically, there's a lot of. Oh, well, there's a. Uh, oh, no, I guess it's crazy. I have to move this. Keep texting Brian. He's not hearing us. <laughs> oh, test that. Yeah. Oh yeah, we uh, yeah we have not moved. Have not what? Still gone? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, very very strange. It's Aliens like, on Water Street. It's like yeah. the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, that's it. Well, I guess it's uh, I guess it's tell us. <laughs> we are going to move forward. Here, one sec. <clears throat> Yeah, we're just gonna drive forward a little bit and just see if uh, <laughs> okay. anything. Yeah, because I went from four bars of LTE to two. <laughs> I've had many problems with my phone on Water Street. I used to work on Water Street, and it was like, oh really? I was fine. The next, you couldn't even send a text. Aliens. Oh my gosh. It's aliens. I actually used to work at the zoo where he is right now. So. So, are, am I back or sort of back? Yeah, you're back. Yes, you're back. Okay, well, we we moved about 200 feet, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. It's so okay. Uh, Ross has a question. What, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, what's uh, what's next? Yeah, Ross Allen here again. Um, it's probable I'll be involved in sound baffles and uh, wood frames and the likes of that. And mm -hmm. I do have some questions about that, but primarily I'm thinking about ceiling ones. Are they, mm -hmm. are they positioned to be vertical hanging or horizontal hanging? I'm, I'm thinking of a four foot by eight foot panel with something in it and so on, but I'm just, just my initial question, would these panels be mounted vertically or horizontally? Ah. Very good question. So th the challenging uh, answer is that it depends on the nature of the, uh, the sound issues that we have uh, in that space, because either is possible, but my gut feeling is that uh, we would be looking at primarily horizontally Right, because we don't really need to break up the sound waves that are coming, uh, you know, sort of uh, across, but the ones that are going to be more bouncing from floor to ceiling. So most likely, we're going to be looking at horizontal, and the largest uh, panels are four by four feet, but they could also be two by four feet. Okay, those and, are and they are. Exactly. And I mean, the nice thing with the, and they ideally should have a little bit of an air gap behind them as well. We don't want to literally attach them flush to the ceiling. Uh, ideally, uh, a couple of inches would be uh, ideal to have between the panel and the ceiling. And that'll, in fact, increase its effectiveness. OK, so the other that brings up the point that the, the ceiling is very pointed and mm -hmm. if we put something horizontal up there um mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to be anywhere near the ceiling itself um mm -hmm. horizontal baffle up against a 45 degree roof um mm -hmm. would they be near the peak or would they be one of them 15 feet up and another one 20 feet, 30 feet up in the air. Again, this may be too technical at this point, but yeah, yeah do we... On angles against the ceiling? Like not yeah, quite that's, horizontal? That's Is that what we're thinking? I was yeah, thinking that's, oh, that's horizontal as flat. Ideal. Okay, maybe... Well, I, mean, so hor I mean, horizontal, if you, you know, if you can, but if not, yeah, if they're kind of the matching the natural slope uh, of the ceiling, you know, again, that would be uh, that would be perfectly fine uh, as well. 
you know, we're, we're just trying to avoid those, uh, you know, especially those high and mid frequencies that are going up there from just kind of bouncing back down at awkward angles. So we want to absorb some and we want to diffuse some. And uh, so, I, you know, there's sort, of, there's sort of a reasonable amount of flexibility. If you need to follow the natural flow of the peak, perfectly fine. Uh, you know, you can do that. The effect will still be fine. They don't have to be literally uh, horizontal but they certainly won't probably be vertical because of how the, uh, because of the type of treatment that we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. Oh, Mark. 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 This is Neil. I have a quick oh, question. Hello. Before, uh, Shelby has a question as well, but I have a quick question. Um, could they be hung um, like, like a, a banner, uh, midair, if you will, would that help absorb and diffuse and everything else rather than actually have them fastened to the slope ceiling or, or anything that could they be hung vertically with that? I don't know if I'm explaining myself well enough. Yeah, I know. I get it. I mean, if, you, if you hang them like a banner, the, the, so again, it's possible they'll still interrupt some of the waves, but, and of course, repositioning the speakers. So it's, it's kind of tricky, right? Because hanging them like a banner Sometimes that's exactly what you have to do. We did a Montessori school recently and they needed both because, right? So I will say without, because the speakers aren't exactly where they should be and because the room isn't actually tuned to the best ability, right? In terms of equalizing it and things like this, uh, I would say it's a little bit preemptive to, um, you know, because the chairs that you do have are sound treatment as well, right? Because they now have upholstery on them, whereas the previous pews, which would interrupt sound waves, but they were hard surfaces, right? So I will say, so I, I will say without, you know, I don't want to get into the minutia of something that doesn't, um, you know, that we don't actually know what it's going to sound like yet. I would suggest that if we reposition the speakers and we start getting people, you know, back in the sanctuary, and then we have those chairs with that a little bit of upholstery, right? With with the aim speakers and the the tuned room, we may find that if you worry about the back wall and the uh, the windows, the ceiling may end up not being as high of a priority, right? Because we're trying to control the room, not not deaden it. So is vertical uh, banner-like possible? In some cases, it, it might do what we need, but without it being at that point, you know, it's, uh, it's like saying, you know, how much yogurt am I gonna need to have with my, my, my spicy dinner to take out the heat? Tough to say, you haven't had it yet. Hmm. Uh, I have a couple quick questions about the dance thing for you. Uh, first. Please. When we're talking about stuff on the ceiling, I know you just said that it's it's not necessarily the highest priority. Um, mm -hmm. Would the location necessarily be bang on specific? Because I'm just thinking visually about the roof and not necessarily a, a visually uh, pleasing perspective, but a legal perspective mm -hmm. that we actually had to have weight bearing load points to rig. And mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. limited on those. And we'd actually, we have to have an engineer come in and inspect them. I, but would they, the positions be specific that we'd have to add in uh, load points or could we kind of find where an engineer said you could hang them here and put them there? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, again, when we're talking a, uh, you know, a great question, when we're talking about um, a space of this kind, you know, and a, and a realistic uh, budget, right? The, I guess you can say having, uh, you know, having, the proper amount of material in a in in a good range of degree of coverage, right? That's going to be the biggest thing. And of course, certainly we wouldn't want it all to be, let's say, crammed into the southeast corner. But yeah, within reason, there is a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of yeah, let's move it over six feet or eight feet or two feet if that's going to make the logistics of it far improved yeah absolutely again you know they i guess you can say the the quantity and the 
general proper positioning is kind of the big thing. Yeah, sure. If you have to move it over two feet or six feet, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, more than sufficiently acceptable. Awesome. And I just had a, a quick question about the windows. Brian's idea was fantastic in covering them because they, uh, they do cause problems. Uh, but from a camera mm. perspective, we actually can't cover them. At, we cover the first two um, and kind mm. of one of them just because of where Sharon's sitting during COVID. Uh, however, the others we can't actually cover because of, of I'm not going to get into it, because of camera problems. We can't cover them. Sure. So are there other ways that we could lessen the effect of the windows without actually covering them completely because I, I totally get what you mean by the the curtain fabric I'm, I'm a theater mm -hmm. I very well know that fabric um, but it would block mm -hmm. Good. Kind of the light is there anything that we could still use that's that lets light through I know it wouldn't be as exactly, yeah. you know okay. like for, for that kind of thing I would I would really want to go back into the I'd really want to go back into the space quite frankly you know what and, and have a look at that kind of thing you know because that's you know frankly I'd have to be in that space roughly at the time that you're talking about and sure I get that right because then uh, especially with your uh, you said theater tech background right so you, I mean you know all about lighting so then sure you can block off the windows and uh, now all your powerful daylight is gone and now you have to artificially uh, recreate it and do all that other kind of stuff too, right? Which, which starts to get costly, although that would be awesome too, I'm sure at some point it's, it's uh, down the road. <laughs> it's a dream of mine, but I feel yeah. like it's not happening anytime soon. Oh, it's too funny. Almost every place we do this and put in PEZ cameras, nobody gets lights. Nobody gets lights. So yeah, I mean like for that, for that question, you know, cause honestly, you know, truthfully I have never, you, know, you kind of looked at those windows uh, a little bit, but frankly, that was never a primary focus. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say something off the cuff about something that I didn't look at super closely. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there would be some creative solutions that we could kind of get to as well as I'm sure you could as well. But like that to me, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make something up about, uh, you know, about a space like that just off the cuff it's just not I just don't like to do stuff off the cuff and, and those types of things it wouldn't be a serious recommendation awesome thank you oh my uh, it's it's Bruce I'm also just wondering with um putting curtains on on windows um right now is really not a, a ideal time for it because of COVID um we mm -hmm. can't really sanitize them without um, if you were spray it with the, the spray gun, it's going to, you're going to see the spray pattern hitting it and it's going to look mm -hmm. awful. So right now is probably not a time to even think about curtains within the church for the windows. Sure. Just, I mean, you know, like I said, fair enough. I mean, like I said, that's, you know, not a, not a, it's a, definitely a, a problem that you'll have to deal with at, uh, uh, at some point and whatnot. And again, we'd have to look at different ways that that could be done. You know, again, different cameras, uh, different sound, you know, things and whatnot. I mean, the trouble is most things that let light through uh, end up not being so good with the uh, uh, with the sound either. I've seen some people that kind of build wooden diffusers, you know, almost like uh, almost like shutters or something like this, right, where they still let some light through, but uh, essentially you'll have these then kind of. Um, uh, you know, wooden flats, basically, right? That'll uh, allow you to get a, a little bit of a combination of both. And if you have a really handy uh, woodworker there, you know, I'm sure he could come up with some uh, nice designs that look pretty cool, but might even allow you to keep the light and diffuse some of the frequencies. You know, it wouldn't really absorb, but it would diffuse. Hey, Marcus, Brian here again. Mm -hmm. um, just, just Hello. ideas too, like just coming to me I don't know how practical they are but I've been in lots of recording studios that use a uh, like pegboard mm -hmm. and it's got holes in it right to let some stuff so, some filter through and some reflect is yep. so, something like that possible potentially like I mean just I mean it, we might not even need them once we do the back wall it's a wait and see thing but the idea of you know a hard reflective surface that's easily cleaned 
with holes in it to allow some sound to diffuse through it and get trapped. Yeah, you know, like that could, you know, could happen again. I, I'd probably do it more with like, you know, slats, more like a diffuser. Because you know, I'm sure you've seen that in the studios too, where they have like the, you know, the various wooden uh, slats, things called like Helmholtz resonators and, and, and complicated things like that. And yeah, there are definitely things that, there definitely would be things like that that could be done to kind of help a little bit, you know, and to try to balance the need for, the need for light and the need for, need for diffusion. Yeah, the reason but I yeah, say yeah. like that, I was wondering if there was a, a product you knew of, because, I mean, let's be honest, when I'm in recording studios, uh, some of them are kind of butt ugly, right? Because they're the rooms are dead and they're, they, you know, nobody yep. goes in there to see a show or, or, or you know, for the ambiance. No, no, no. But this no. is different, too, because it's a it's a sanctuary. So while it has to be functional, it, it has also to be has pretty, to be, Brian. it has to be, Heather says pretty. Pegboard is ugly, Brian. It's funny. Well, you know, again, to me, like what I would do would be to do uh, uh, you know, wooden slats kind of running uh, vertically, kind of yeah. in a frame around the window. And then, you know, typically just like hopefully the, the sound panels might be, uh, I would use a wood that kind of really respects the, the space. And again, something that looks intentional so that it looks like, oh, was this always here? Because it sure looks like it could have been, right? That's yeah. always our thing in a traditional sanctuary. And uh, yeah, like, so if you imagine, you know, just slats of wood, maybe uh, three quarters or one inch thick, maybe three to five inches deep, and they're going to be running uh, vertically uh, above the window. So it's almost like a blind sideways, but going the long mm -hmm. way, right? And, and, and those uh, little panels could get like they're kind of pinned on the top and the bottom so they will be a little bit flexible in terms of turning and that's how you can allow the light to get in as well as the uh, uh, diffusing to uh, to happen as well so sure again there are there are ways of of doing it where you know you, you could keep the light and you could at least uh, you know keep the sound in check a little bit so there are options what about and again, again and they would look pretty what about uh, pegboards? I know a lot of theaters, no, sorry, not pegboards. That was in my brain. Um, uh, oh, shit, what are they called? Um, there's a name, for, uh, perforated wood panels. I know theaters use that a lot because uh, they more or less, once they're painted and kind of there, they they look like they've always been oh. there. But are you, are you talking about lattice? No, so, uh, the ones that I've seen, I'm sure there are many variations, but it's literally a wood panel with like five eighths holes in it. Yeah, that's what I that's what I meant when I said pegboard. I didn't know what it was called. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, no 1970s retail store decor, please. That's no, what I was thinking of. I was thinking of the 70s. That's what I think of. So was I. It's uh, it's Ross here again. I'm wondering if I could. Uh, divert the conversation to number one priority the mixer the sound panel and the likes of that and what your recommendations would be there yeah definitely like i said for me number one uh the mixer because it will allow us to get the best out of every other piece of equipment that's currently in there and it'll allow us to then, you know, it'll kind of allow us slash force us to go to that next generation workflow and means of operating and learning. The mixer will be the piece of equipment that'll require the most learning to operate anyway. So the more experience you have, you know, as, as I'm sure everybody here that I'm chatting with has some skills, you know, whether you're cooking, whether you're doing theater, whether you're doing sound, whether you're playing drums, if you work on the easiest stuff the most, you'll never be good at the hard stuff. And the mixer, because it'll bring about the biggest change and the biggest degree of potential, but because it's the most, it's gonna require the most skill to use, again, I would say that has to be first and it'll allow you to get the absolute best out of the system. And if you pressed me down, I would say the mixer and reorienting the speakers to the best position that you have now. That would be priority number one. Uh, then I would do sound treatment 
the first phase of sound treatment as priority number two. And then I would say upgrade the speakers as priority number three, and then additional sound system once the best sound has been wrung out of that room at that stage. All right. Marcus, Brian again. I sorry. Ross is trying oh, to Oh sorry, Ross. Ross is finishing up. Sorry, Ross. I didn't hear you, brother. <laughs> okay. No, I just just um again, just to follow up on that number one again, Shelby and Neil, and some of you may know the answer to this already. I don't think I do, but my question is what has to change in the sound booth as far as the panel or the mixer goes to, to what we have now? So, so what you have now, you know, again, would have been, you know, that mixer would have been what churches would have bought 15 or 20 years ago, typically. Same brand, incidentally, it's Allen & Heath. So what is it missing uh, is all kinds of uh, in upward gear. So what will happen is basically the mixer that you have now, what it can do is to make sounds louder or quieter and to very crudely equalize each sound source, which is to add or subtract highs, lows, or mids in, in a fairly crude uh, manner. Uh, what it doesn't allow us to do is to uh, do really detailed kind of sound carving. It doesn't really allow us to have, uh, you know, to free properly flatten and equalize room for sophisticated settings. It doesn't allow us to get the most clear sound out of each microphone before feedback. It doesn't have any dynamics control. There's a very vital piece of audio equipment called a compressor. And what it does is to decrease the difference between the loudest and the quietest uh, parts of a signal. So what will happen is, you know, when you listen to a concert, when you listen to a professionally done stream, when you listen to a well-mixed movie, you'll find that the quiet parts aren't actually that quiet and the loud parts aren't actually that loud. They retain the character of being softer or louder sounds but the actual range of dynamics is reasonably slim. You know, imagine that you're talking to somebody who's whispering and then they sneeze right in your ear. That's very unpleasant. We want to minimize the difference between quiet and loud. And what a digital mixer like that does, in addition to all the other things, it has a separate compressor on each and every instrument, on each and every microphone that you can preset and program to be ideal for that. We can then even have a compressor that changes the sound, the overall master sound for the sanctuary. But for the stream, we might want even more compression. We want that stream to be as consistent in sound as possible. Uh, you know, I, I have a friend that, for example, works doing even shows with for the Discovery Channel and things like this. And broadcast sound really needs to have a very small uh, range of variability because you don't want people to be unsure of, well, how loud do I set this thing, right? If you had to change your TV six times during a show, it's typically not good. And we want to have that capability for the stream as well without having to affect the sound of the sound of the sanctuary. And we want it to be consistent week after week. And that's what the additional power of that mixer affords us. Thank you. My pleasure. Next, was, what, did, you, did that answer your question too, Brian? Yeah, no, no, I was, oh yes, I did have one silly question. When you, when you mm -hmm. uh, describe the process of mixer, move speakers, back sound treatment, and potentially mm -hmm. new monitors would be wonderful and microphones and all the extra, bells and whistles it would make it you know incredible um there still may be that that's at, at that point after we get the uh first sound treatments and the speakers moved and the board is when we would have to mm -hmm. assess whether or not we require additional sound treatment as well right and speakers, and, speakers. yeah 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 uh, yeah i mean uh, absolutely i think that's the best way to go because you know 
you know, as, as we all know, changing too many variables is just not typically the way uh, to go, especially when you're trying to make sure that every dollar that you're spending uh, makes sense. You know, and again, in the church sense in particular, you know, we talk about good stewardship all the time. And yeah, so to me, the best, the, you know, the plan we're talking about is also about that principle of uh, stewardship. We know that we're going to need some sound treatment, and we have a pretty good idea of the most egregious uh, culprit for reflections, which is going to be towards the uh, the back there. So yeah, we deal with that, and then you kind of reevaluate because the good news is, no matter what, it's going to be significantly better than it was. That's the thing we can be very confident about. And then there's always that law of diminishing returns, where you say, okay, wow, we got 60% of the result that we're probably ever going to get in a space like this, right? And but maybe for 25% of the money. Right. And then to do these little things like, yeah, working on the ceiling, this is expensive, right? This isn't this isn't casual stuff we're going to do here. So, yeah, always, you know, so my principle is let's work on the stuff that's going to make the biggest impact for the most reasonable amount of money, something we're not going to regret or wish to go backwards on. Yeah, exactly. Right. Reevaluate, reevaluate and, uh, you know, see what the priorities are. I mean, I'm sure if your church is like a like our church. It just when you just when you think you were going to do that as the next stage, some wonderful bill comes up and you you don't get to do it, and then you're very happy that you did the you know, the good chunk when you did. Uh, can I ask a, a question on that? Um, you're kind of saying that the very first phase is the board and the speakers. I 100% agree. I really don't like our board. Um, yep. With that and position repositioning the speakers to be specific, um, yep. just kind of looking at our timeline, it could be a year, mm -hmm. it could be ten years, based on on money. And like you said, you never know what's going to come up. And really hope it's not ten absolutely. Years. Um, mm -hmm. but the possibility of you know possibly a, a cheap solution to the speaker is be just a better amp for it, a better power amp because I know the power amp we have right now is is essentially an old powered board. It is not good and <laughs> yep. not helping the speakers at all to do their full job. So it even just getting a better power amp and repositioning the speakers be a good move in that first step or would it just kind of be a waste? Uh, you know, again, fantastic question. And I couldn't echo your sentiments about the power amp that you currently have any differently, right? 100%. Uh, so yeah, to me, you definitely... I think it's a sensible thing and it's correct. We'd get better sound and more headroom out of those speakers than we've ever had. Totally correct. And it wouldn't be a waste if you bought a power amp good enough to even power better speakers down the road, right? So if you could say, yeah, we're gonna get better speakers later, but we have to conserve the money. So let's get a power amp that will power the best speakers that we're reasonably going to get. And, you know, as, as I think most people know, you know, even old stereo systems, the power amps tend to last. So a professional sound amplifier for a space like this, you know, frankly, most of these power amps, they're designed to work 20, 30 hours a week. You know, the, the sanctuary is running, what, two, three, four hours a week. You're not putting a heavy load of wear and tear on any of this equipment. So yeah, if you get a good power amp, you improve those speakers, definitely. You get the board, you improve those speakers, you, you reposition the speakers, you improve those speakers. Yeah, I would definitely say, I don't even consider it a stopgap solution. I would consider that one part of the speaker upgrade and you just happen to go for the power amp first. I think it's uh, definitely a good idea within the realm of getting an amp good enough to also run upgraded speakers later. No, it's a good idea. Um, Marcus, it's Brian again. I had uh, two two things I just wanted to interject. I took a look at the sanctuary when I was in and where the suspended lights are just by those big pillars that we kind of have. And it looks to mm -hmm. me like that's probably where they ran the wires. So putting in AC drops there for powered speakers might not be that big a deal. But... Um, so whatever we went with is, is cool. My, my question is, uh, well, just more of a comment. I know that every year, um, COVID pending, 
we used to have the Qantas Festival in there for like 10 days and you know and because they got that beautiful grand piano and the room used to sound so good so I mean to me I'm thinking sound treatment's got to be a priority too in in terms of uh making the space usable for other people to help generate revenue to keep the doors open as well I don't know if we right. rent it or not Sorry, and to clarify, and that because I kind of got a, a bit of a feeling that that was something, but to confirm, right, that's that's part of the the thinking, right, that the space should be able to potentially generate some revenue if possible, correct? Yeah, I, I, that's what I, well, that's okay. my understanding. I think. Yeah, that was you know, it sounds was very sensible. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah totally. Totally. Oh, still there? Yeah. yeah. Still here. Just, just, does anybody, we got anything else? Uh, I just want to ask a pretty much a strict opinion question, actually, of, of yours, Marcus, because you, uh, like you said, you have a lot of experience working in churches. Um, have you mm. ever worked in a church? I know they're being used all over North Ontario right now, but have you ever worked with HK Polars specifically? Sorry, you said HK Polars? Yeah, HK uh, 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 So to me, that sounds like one of those column systems. They are. They're Bose HK Polars. They're being used in, in festivals and uh, uh, new theaters yep. in all of Northern Ontario. I've never seen them in a church, but they only came no, out 12 months ago. <laughs> well, we, we actually carry them at the store, as a matter of fact. So I, I just couldn't understand it that clearly. But yeah, it's, it's got it's kind of like the as people would often say, it's like the Bose type system lots of the companies do it yeah where you've got a a little subwoofer and then a stack of um i think that one's about a 900 dollars one that you're talking about the the polar 10 if i'm not mistaken yeah. i have to admit i'm personally not a big fan of those types of things for anything permanent but i always kind of enjoy them uh, you know uh, a portable thing is it ideal? No, it's not ideal, and I would never use it in an install, or in most cases, not. But yeah, it's, you know, it's a it's a neat uh, it's a neat concept uh, as far as that kind of stuff goes. Marcus, of that kind of style, the bows I actually I don't like at all. Speaking of bows, Marcus, the, what you're describing, just so I I don't I'm not familiar with that particular brand, but I'm using a bows column when I do a single mm -hmm. or a dual, same kind of an idea? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, you got it. Yep, same kind yep. of idea. I feel like they have to come up with a good kind of, you know, uh, name for these things so that it's easy that we're talking about the uh, the same thing. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, it's got the subwoofer typically and then a, a, a column with some little tweeters. It's like a portable line array. Is that what they usually call yeah, it? I mean, for, for, yeah. a small, for, a, for a small room and an acoustic guitar, it's it's killer. They're really they're really nice and they're very light and they're very portable. But I don't know what. It, yeah, cool. Yeah, I only ask because yeah. uh, uh -huh. a friend of mine is using them right now in a jazz festival with like 15, 20 piece bands in Sudbury right now. It's like mm -hmm. they're second to none. He's he's a loyal Martin guy. He's used Martin his entire career. He's an audio technician by trade, and he mm -hmm. bought them and he's like, I'm ready to throw out my Martins. Well, you know what? If he's putting a good price on the Martins, let me know because I'll scoop <laughs> them up. But you know, but you know what I mean. Uh, what can you say? You know, I mean, I, I don't know the person. I don't know the context. Uh, like I said, we we carry the the polar. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I you know I probably wouldn't go that far on it. But you know, what can you say? It's always great. You know, like I'm, I. I hate saying bad stuff about other people or other gear. Kind of like, what's what's the point of uh, uh, of negativity? If you have a person who's experienced and that's what they decide to buy and it works for them, hey, you know, more, uh, more power to them. I think it won't make me, uh, you know, it won't me recommend the product where I don't think it's a good product. But hey, great if it works. You know, again, fantastic. They're a reasonable price. So uh, yeah, nice not to have to take a lot around. You know, take a lot of stuff around. We had a rental at the store this weekend. Uh, a person wanted to rent four powered speakers. They thought they needed that because somebody had told them this is what they need. It turns out it was uh, two people with a mandolin and acoustic guitar singing a gazebo for 20 plus people. 
So we got them the right board and one powered speaker, and they came back effusively happy uh, today. You know, so that's always what it comes down to. You know, context, what works, what's easy to use, and then you go from there. But do you have anything else for Mark? <clears throat> you've you've awed us all, I guess. Everybody's speechless now. <laughs> well, 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 there you go. Wunderbar. Yeah, very good. <laughs> well, um, thank you, Marcus, for, for showing up and presenting to us and uh, explaining some of the, um, um, you know, explaining, explaining the breakdown, basically, of what 